Well, hey guys, in today's video, I have 10 skincare swaps for you all. And by swaps, I mean these are products that you might wanna choose next time you go to restock, either because they are less expensive, so it's gonna save you money in the long run, or frankly, more effective, or they're just simpler. And who doesn't like simple? I sure do. When things are overly complicated, I tend to throw in the towel, and I think that's the case with most people. All right, number one, chances are, if you've watched my videos, I've encouraged you to moisturize your face. If you're using a facial moisturizer, however, consider instead using your body lotion on your face. Um, why? Well, it ends up oftentimes being a lot less expensive, and truthfully, there's not much difference between a body lotion and a lotion for the face. Um, skincare manufacturers, they're never gonna tell you that it's okay to put their body lotion on your face. Why? Well, truthfully, they don't test the product that way, and so it makes them a little nervous with their legal team <laughs> to say things like that. But there's really oftentimes no difference between a body moisturizer and a facial moisturizer. I would say the main difference that you might find between these two is that body products tend to be heavier, whereas facial products are formulated to feel more lightweight. They often have silicones, things like dimethicone, which feel a lot lighter on the skin. So you might not like the way that the body lotion feels, but give it a try. Chances are you have a body lotion already that you're using Using, give it a try on your face. If you like it, it can end up saving you money in the long run to use that instead of your facial moisturizer. Number two is aftershave. Ditch your aftershave. It is nothing but alcohol and fragrance. It doesn't offer any benefit. Aftershave, I think, was something that they encouraged men to use just to get them to buy something and, you know, with the hopes of smelling good. Yes, they do smell good, but you guys know from my videos that fragrance on the skin can actually end up being really irritating. So it definitely doesn't really have much of a purpose in aftershave. Instead, it's a much better choice to apply a moisturizer. Going back to point one, if you really like to simplify things, definitely consider just putting your body lotion on your face as an aftershave. But why is moisturizing so important after you shave? Well, the act of shaving actually is a way of exfoliating the skin, and that ends up leading to more water loss out of the skin in that short-term period after, after the act of shaving. And that can lead long-term to dryness, irritation, and it also puts you at risk for ingrown hairs. Moisturizing the face after you have rinsed off all the shave residue helps reduce water loss out of the skin and can help cut down on the formation of ingrown hairs. Number three is a really simple skincare swap hack, and that is swap out the sunscreen that you're using around your eyes for your lip sunscreen. Yes, that's right. A lot of people don't tolerate sunscreens around the eyes. They burn, they sting, especially chemical sunscreens. It's a real stumbling block for many people. Unfortunately, skin cancers around the eyes are very common, not to mention crow's feet related to sun damage. Those are things that we're trying to prevent by wearing sunscreen. So definitely try a lip sunscreen around your eyes. They're often a lot easier to tolerate. And you guys know from my videos, I am a huge fan Let's see the flash. I'm a huge fan, obviously, of the Vanny Cream Lip SPF. This works really well around the eyes. So definitely consider that swap if you find that sunscreens on the eyelids burn and sting. Number four, ditch your vitamin C derivatives. What the heck are vitamin C derivatives? Well, you guys have probably heard that putting vitamin C on the skin can help reduce sun damage and long-term use has the potential to boost up collagen in the deeper layers of the skin, having a wrinkle smoothing outcome. Also, vitamin C applied to the skin can help reduce hyperpigmentation. So like, why would you wanna ditch any of that? Well. Unfortunately, uh, vitamin C, L-ascorbic acid, it's really challenging to formulate such that not only is it stable in the tube, but is it stable on your skin and does it actually get into your skin to do what it needs to do? Meaning not only improve hyperpigmentation and reduce sun damage, but boost up collagen production. So manufacturers have a variety of vitamin C alternatives as I like to call them, and I'll put a list of the names here. Um, but why should you ditch those? Well, they're really not evidence-based for the outcome of boosting up collagen production. They can, however, help with hyperpigmentation. So I'm not saying that they're necessarily bad, but I think it depends on what it is that you want out of the product. If you are looking for a product that boosts collagen production, choose a retinol. 
Retinols can, with long-term use, boost up collagen production in the deeper layers of the skin. Um, I will list some of my favorites down below, and I'll also put a card somewhere here that is a video of my favorite retinols. So retinol is a better option if you really are seeking um, a boost in collagen production and that downstream effect of smoothing out wrinkles and fine lines. Number five, if you are using Neosporin to cuts, definitely consider swapping it out for good old fashioned fashion, uh, Vaseline, petroleum jelly, 100% USP petroleum petrolatum, which is what is in Vaseline. It doesn't have to be the name brand Vaseline, you can use the generic. Why do I say that? Well, Neosporin actually is a topical antibiotic and much of the benefit that consumers appreciate from that product comes down to the fact that they're basically putting Vaseline on their skin. But the antibiotics in Neosporin are not that great and they're not that great at killing off the bacteria that can be problematic. They're not really necessary and they're a very common cause of contact dermatitis. So rather than using Neosporin, I suggest just using plain petrolatum. A lot of the benefit people see from using Neosporin really just comes from the fact that they are putting petrolatum on the skin, but they're increasing the risk of contact dermatitis to those not so great antibiotics and they could just be using Vaseline to get the same, same results. So that is a simple swap right there. Number six has to do with peeling skin, which I know a lot of you guys deal with either from a prescription retinoid or maybe some other topical that increases skin cell turnover it can cause a lot of peeling in the beginning, or God forbid, maybe you recently got too much sun and now the skin is peeling. What should you not use and stop using? Stop using scrubs to remove the flaking scaly skin. Why? Well, you're gonna cause a lot of irritation by scrubbing the skin. Many scrubs have these little gritty particles that create micro tears, which end up injuring the skin and leading to more water loss and more irritation. And the downstream effect of that is gonna be more peeling and can flare the acne. So what should you do in the case where you're having a lot of peeling skin from either an exfoliating product or from you know post sun exposure? Rather than scrub that away and exfoliate that away, you really wanna moisturize. It's recommended to use moisturizer. However, I will acknowledge the fact that when you have a lot of flaking and you put a moisturizer on over it, it's just, I don't know, it doesn't look very good and it's kind of odd. It looks patchy, I understand that. What I suggest instead in this situation is actually a little unusual for me, but I find that it actually works quite well. And that is to use a facial oil just to that spot. Why? Well, facial oils, they slip in between those shedding skin cells, helping to moisturize the skin underneath, they, but they don't end up being patchy on the skin. And this is a very inexpensive facial oil that I personally enjoy. It's by Good Molecules. It's their ultra hydrating facial oil. It has sea buckthorn in it. So whenever you have peeling skin, just take a little tiny drop of this, pat it to the area of peeling, kind of gently massage it in. You'll notice that some of those skin cells that are you know, trying to shed and fall off will come off, but you're not generating more irritation underneath the skin and you're instead depositing behind moisturizing emollients that help soften skin cell edges and just smooth things out. Plus a lot of oils like this, which has sea buckthorn in it, they do have antioxidants in them naturally, which can you know, help with healing. So that is a better alternative than scrubbing or buffing away that peeling skin. That actually ends up causing more irritation. So that would be a suggestion in those situations is to use just a facial oil to those areas. It can definitely help. Number seven, stop buying those natural deodorants laden with essential oils. Instead, I recommend using a benzoyl peroxide acne wash like Panoxyl in the armpit. How do you use this? Well, you just, while you're in the shower, just lather it to the armpits, let it sit on the skin for a few minutes, and then rinse it off. You may wanna moisturize the armpits after the fact because it can be a little drying and irritating, but why should you do that instead of use natural deodorants? Natural deodorants often have a lot of essential oils in them, which are incredibly irritating in the armpit skin where you have skin on skin contact plus the moisture from sweat. 
you can cause a lot of problems. And some of the compounds in both natural and synthetic fragrance and essential oils actually can cause hyperpigmentation in the armpit, which a lot of, oddly enough, you know, a lot of people go to these natural deodorants trying to improve hyperpigmentation in the armpits and it actually can worsen and or cause that. So stop using the natural deodorants like Schmitz. They have a lot of essential oils cause a lot of problems in people's armpits instead if you want to if you want to deodorize i suggest using benzoyl peroxide while you're in the shower it is a much better better option for you it will cut it, basically what it does is it reduces the bacteria in the armpit that break down sweat and generate those odiferous compounds that make you smell bad so that is another simpler swap number eight ditch your dht blocking hair loss shampoos there is a huge market for these. Um, what do they do? Well, they claim to block DHT, and that is what is responsible for miniaturization of the hair follicle and, and subsequent balding in pattern hair loss, which can be seen in both men and women. Um, however, the topical shampoos and things and, and topical DHT blockers, a lot of times they have questionable ingredients with very limited to no data to support their use. They're really gimmicky cash grabs. Instead, a better, more evidence-based, and often more affordable swap is zinc pyrithione anti-dandruff shampoo. Why? Well, zinc pyrithione in anti-dandruff shampoos, such as Head & Shoulders, has been shown to reduce inflammation that contributes to um, the progression of the hair loss. It also reduces that little yeast that colonizes the scalp and causes a lot of inflammation that may you know, push the progression of hair loss. And it's, the zinc is actually anti-inflammatory, plus it will help cut down on dandruff if you happen to deal with that. Or if you deal with seborrheic dermatitis on the face, treating the scalp with an anti-dandruff shampoo can actually help improve that condition as well. So you're getting a lot of benefits here by using an anti-dandruff shampoo to the scalp as opposed to a DHT blocking shampoo with questionable ingredients. Um, how do you use it? Well, when you're in the shower, just put a tiny amount to the scalp, lather it to the scalp exclusively. You don't need to put it throughout your hair and leave it on there for a few minutes while you're in the shower and then rinse it off, rinse it out. A lot of people don't like the way that these shampoos smell or the way that they leave their hair feeling. So if you like, it's fine to use a regular shampoo after to actually wash your hair um, and you know to get rid of the scent of the anti-dandruff shampoo and then follow it up with a conditioner because they it can be a little drying. But honestly, Head & Shoulders has come out with a lot of new formulas in the past year or so. And a lot of them are a lot more, you know, they leave the hair a lot more manageable, especially if you have uh, coily hair. I think some of the newer formulas are a lot better. Number nine is the enzyme peels. Those, you know, you may be choosing for exfoliating. Uh, what do they have in them? Things like papaya fruit extract, pineapple fruit extract, different fruit extracts. These enzymes, they exfoliate the skin just by digesting the proteins in the top layer of the skin, and that can have a smoothing effect and exfoliate. But they're not super precise, and while they're touted as being less irritating, I actually find that they can end up being more irritating, especially if you are sensitive to fruits, you have any kind of fruit allergy, um, they're just not the best way to exfoliate. Instead, I suggest swapping those out for a hydroxy acid. Why? Well, hydroxy acids, they actually can help uh, in stimulating skin cell turnover, which ultimately, long-term, is what's going to help in boosting up collagen production. I suggest an alpha hydroxy acid. You can either use it as a toner, a lotion, a moisturizer, or some of the peel products out there are a good option for this. I will list some alpha hydroxy acid products down below in the description box. What if you're really sensitive and you don't get along with alpha hydroxy acids? What should you use instead? Polyhydroxy acids. These very, very, very gently exfoliate the skin but improve moisture content. And last but not least, ditch the expensive medical grade skincare. Um, medical grade is really just a marketing term. It doesn't have any, you know, there's no regulation or oversight to the use of that term. And it's a marketing term that is used to 
uh, kind of give like a doctor approved appeal to things. And a lot of times those products are sold in physicians' offices. So, you know, the consumer feels like they're getting a doctor recommendation, but truthfully, they're not really any better than what you can get in the drugstore. And in many, many cases, the same parent company that makes the medical grade skincare products has a drugstore product as well. They're just marketing to a different audience, but the medical grade stuff is typically a lot more expensive. As a reminder, I have a video comparing SkinCeuticals uh, moisturizer to CeraVe's moisturizer. The cost difference is mind boggling, but the ingredients are virtually identical with the exception of the fact that the SkinCeuticals one adds fragrance. Why? Well, fragrance has that luxury appeal, which makes the consumer think that they're getting something that they have paid for. But in reality, when we're talking about benefit to the skin, medical grade is not offering you anything over, over affordable alternatives in the drugstore. So, you know, people, if you, if you buy medical grade skincare and you like it and you know, you like what it, the results that you see, then keep using it. But for those of you out there who, you know, maybe you're new to skincare and you hear a lot of advertisements about medical grade and, you know, it's kind of intimidating, don't fall for the marketing necessarily because it's not as though it's any better. Medical grade is not necessarily any better. It doesn't mean that it won't cause problems for you. It's just a, another way to market those products. So definitely consider swapping out some of those more expensive products, especially things like a face wash. A product I spend big bucks on from medical grade brands is gonna be sunscreen because a lot of times those sunscreens just look nicer and are more likely to stay consistent, which is the most important thing when it comes to your skincare routine is staying consistent with your sunscreen and sun protection. So I often will drop more on, on expensive sunscreens because I like the way that they look but I also use a lot of affordable drugstore sunscreens as well that look you know, pretty good too. Um, so if you're new here, I definitely have videos on budget-friendly sunscreens and skincare recommendations. So um, check those out. Um, and if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends. And as always, don't forget, sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye.